This is Red Moon Role Playing. We begin this final session by checking your dramatic hooks, starting with Dr. Christensen. How many do you have active currently? I currently have one hook active, and that's to investigate the tunnels under the veterinary center. That's my obsession, because it decided to pair that together to what happened in the woods. Yes, indeed. And, um... Craig, do you have a hook for Dr. Christensen? Something that you would like him to investigate, or...? Well, I think, as it could be our last session, I think let's help that maybe happen uh, be by being direct. I think you must find your specimens. Uh, Mr. Coleman, uh, how many active hooks do you have currently? I still have my one active, which is find out how to keep it on. I'd like to do that. I'd like to keep it on. So then you need another hook. Uh, do you have a hook for Mr. Coleman? I, I guess kind of watch my back as I... Uh, throw myself into this and trying to find the last clues of this uh, specimen. Now, when you find your specimens, everything will be good, and we can get back to our lives. Because I, you know, I owe you, and you guilt tripped me, and you know, yeah. Yeah, it's like I guess the whole idea is like to feel that you're even. Exactly. It is now the evening of Monday, the eleventh, and it started getting dark outside as you've been investigating the home of Doctor Whitehead. You have found some evidence that she has uncovered showing that the threatening letters addressed to her were printed by a printer connected to the dorm Wi-Fi at Weatherford Hall at the OSU campus. Now, somewhat unfortunately, you are aware of the fact that the campus is currently occupied by the students. Exactly what that means, you're not quite sure, but it seemed on the news as though uh, they had taken control of the place, and given what's going on in the rest of the city... Yes, it doesn't necessarily seem like the most safe place to try to enter at the moment. The um, the occupation seems to be part of the wider protests after the election results were announced. So getting in might not be so easy. And there's no telling if other students might have seen the tape, Dr. Christensen, the tape of your experiments. I mean, you know kids, they... They want to show each other the latest hot video, right? So perhaps there are others who are aware and who might take umbrage with what they saw you doing on that video. Might not be all that safe. You too, Mr. Coleman, might have some issues as you are a rather well-known person in the city. You do attend all the big events, all the big ribbon cuttings and all of that and well your money is old and it comes from mining mining of sometimes well shall we say rather controversial types of metals with issues connected to them not to mention your lovely collection of african bronzes and other things that some people might consider not to be something that could be legitimately yours under any circumstance so yes, you might not find yourself the most popular person on campus, especially given the prevailing winds. But all this said, Dr. Christensen, you pointed something out. You might not need to be seen by anyone. Because you have seen that underneath the campus seemingly lies a sprawling tunnel network that seemed to connect different buildings. You didn't necessarily see connections to the main campus, but at least the College of Veterinary Medicine was there, the stadium. Perhaps there's more. From what you could see, the space was used for both cabling, machinery, as well as for various shelters, likely a remnant from the good old Cold War. Now, there should be many entrances to these tunnels. I mean, spread out all across the the campus, presumably but you are only aware of the exact location of one such entrance, the Alumni Center. You reached the tunnels through the Alumni Center when you were looking for Dr. Whitehead. So that is where you now find yourself, in Dr. Whitehead's bedroom. You have looked into her laptop and you have have seen how she lived and the kind of things 
that she chose to surround herself with. What do you do? I feel like I have a first lead as defining the specimen, and that, at this point, supersedes more or less everything, especially as it seems I can now count on Coleman to help me out and locate it. I look around the room. Uh, I see the nightstand and I decide to just have a quick look in the drawers to see if there's anything of seeming importance there as well before we go. You uh, open up the nightstand. It features um, sets of sex toys, massage oils, all very neatly sorted. Quite an advanced collection, really offering options that you certainly have never explored in your life. Or have you? Uh, well, we uh, we are actually quite quite the explorers, me and my, my wife ourselves. There are, of course, extremes that we might not have visited yet. Well, Dr. Whitehead has. Yes, she has. In some ways, that's a pity, seeing as we didn't seem to have many things to talk about uh, outside of work that that could actually have been a, an interesting conversation. Now, let's put that aside for a bit. I close the nightstand drawer as I look up at... How did you feel looking at that most private of areas? I mean, it was an area that clearly you were never supposed to see. And she's dead. Does that make you feel any particular way? Having invaded a dead person's privacy in this way? Being a doctor, I have a practical way sometimes that looking at death it's it it came too early for her it's a sad thing but she's gone now and uh, maybe even in a better place I think for all that it matters we are here to try and fulfill the work the duty that me and Whitehead started. And I don't think she would mind that particular little slight, seeing as how much she put into this. And now we're... We might be able to finish it. You might. Yes. I look up at you and I say, I think we've found what we need. There is a... There is a pretty strong indication here that the, well, whatever has been sent out, threats and so on, they seem to come from, well, originate from the campus, a place called the Weatherford Hall. I, I have an idea of how we could get in there if, uh, if you are planning to, to help me with this. Well, sure, of course. Uh, anything I can do to help. What exactly did you have in mind? Uh, well, what, what, can't I just walk in? What I've seen on the news is that it's pretty, pretty occupied right now. Students are just getting in the way of anyone trying to do anything. But if you remember when we were at the alumni hall, uh, I disappeared for a minute there, and as it happened, it was... Dr. Whitehead having gotten lost uh, in the basement trying to find a a place to smoke. And down there I found some most interesting uh, tunnels. And they seem to connect throughout the campus. So my thought is that if we go through the alumni hall, we might be able to connect into the different parts of the campus and, and get there. I mean, I suppose if you think that's the best route, sounds a little, uh, undercover. And at that point, I take out my phone, and I do just start looking up the news, because it does sound familiar, but maybe I haven't personally read the situation. How bad is it? You met Mr. Bergeron previously, right? He was in his riot gear. Yes, there's footage of riot police and protesters clashing in the city of buildings ablaze. Protesters encounter protesters. There's so much anger, so much violence, so much hate in the air. And there's a lot of people who are taking the opportunity to to come in from outside to join these protests. It's fun, isn't it? To tear things down, to destroy. 
Let me make some phone calls. Uh, let's see if I can get someone who can get us in those tunnels. That might not be a, a bad idea, per se. Uh, and I, I I would put an extra weight here that this is regarding stolen material that we suspect might be in possession of these people, namely my work, my, my specimen that is still alive. Um, of course, doctor, doctor, you're giving all these details. I don't need them, and I can tell you right now, most people don't need them either. In fact, sometimes it's better if people know as little as possible uh, for these sort of things. We just need someone to get us in. I'll, I'll handle this, and, and also, I need to go back to my place and pick something up, uh, but I can meet you there, and, well, I'll, I'll, I'll keep in touch, but I can get us a guy who can get us in. Safely. Yeah, yeah. That's... Perfect. Thank you. I'll meet you there. And with that, I head to my car, eager to get out of this house. Even though she didn't die here, it still feels a bit creepy, going through her belongings and so on. Poor Dr. Whitehead. And I'm gonna try and use influential friends here. I'm trying to get access to a restricted location. I don't want police. That actually could be problematic. But maybe just like a technician or a maintenance man, because I don't want to wander around tunnels not knowing where I'm going. But if they can get us to where we need to go quickly, well, someone could know. Fifteen. Well, you have many influential friends, of course, people connected with the university and those that would have full access to the Alumni Center. And the person that is going to help you here is... One of the deans at the university. You have been supporting some of their research with with some of the donations that you have been making. Um, things connected to archaeology and, and matters like that, connected to you, where your interests lie, basically, with with the, the artifacts and, and, and history and all that stuff. And, yes, they are able to make some calls, and what they tell you is that when you get to the Alumni Center, the cleaning company who is there at the moment will open the door for you and they will not get in the way of you going down into those tunnels. So you will have access to where Dr. Christensen entered previously. I nod as I finish the phone call and then I drive back home because... This is all very exciting, and of course I do owe Dr. Christensen, but it is also slightly a worrying situation, considering student occupation kind of would like my dagger close at hand. Just in case. Just in case. Of course. Of course. You can go home and get it. It's not a problem at all. Elizabeth is not there anymore, of course. And... Yeah... You get your dagger, do you do anything else? For now, I just pocket it. I dress down a little. I don't want to go to a place like this wearing my nice suit. Let's find an old traveling coat, maybe something quite thick. And I'll think of bringing a torch as well. A small one! We're going into tunnels. God knows how light it is down there. It's all very exciting. But again, a bit anxious as well. But it should be fine, right? We're just going to go in. I guess maybe just... I don't know, I could take some cash with me. I don't take my wallet, of course. But I'll take a little bit of spare cash just in case we need to... Uh, well, appeal to some of these students. They might not like power authority, but it'd be very surprising if they didn't like money. I mean, money helps with lots of things. So maybe a little bit of money could help. Yes, crippling student debt is certainly a thing in the United States, so um, certainly many of them might be very open to uh, getting a, a bit of a donation to, uh, to something like that, yes. Wonderful, and then I will ring Dr. Christensen very quickly as I'm getting in my car. Happy Elizabeth didn't stay, actually. This is all... Well, I think she'll be safer in her place, rather than my place. Let me ask one thing. Did you have firearms at home? Mr. Coleman? Maybe I could bring one. I do have one. Purely for security measures. But... What, what kind of gun is it? Is it something that you have purchased recently? Or is it a, a Glock your father bought in the 90s, perhaps? It's a very fancy modern 9mm. 
Nothing crazy, very standard, but also quite new. Gets the job done. That's what I was told by my security team. Not that I have much of a team, but you know, I do need one occasionally. It's one of those expensive handguns that show up in those video games. I might not use it, but maybe I'll let the doctor have it, because, you know, I have... I mean, I do have something on me if I need to be defended, but he doesn't, so... There we go. Again, it's all just taking into account all the possible situations, and again, I, we're not going to need anything, really, because this isn't going to be that difficult. It's just kids, right? And I mean, you know... Okay, okay it, it did look a little bit serious on the news, a lot of bricks being thrown and things like that. I mean, it certainly feels good to be armed, but but it should be fine. It's just kids, right? Corvallis kids, what can they do? Exactly. And again, dressing down, I have cash on me. Again, if I get mugged, that's fine. I'll give it all over. But hopefully some of them will not be that feral just yet. Hmm. Indeed. Well, you are able to get all that. And then? I think I'd also pack an emergency phone. Because, of course, I have a couple of phones. This is important. Especially when you do things like go out on kayaking trips and then go horribly wrong. I wish I'd had one of those with me then. So I will take a little emergency phone. Nothing personal. It's just a standard phone with police communication, maybe a bit of internet. Absolutely. And I think I will then make the phone call. Uh, Dr. Christensen. I made my way back home as uh, I had left Mikkel uh, alone with the kids. I wanted to see that everything was fine, as well as making sure I had everything I needed before we go. The uh, odd chance that we would uh, actually find the specimen. I need a way to transport it back, to take it with me, and it's not just a little mouse. It's a, it's a, it's a baboon. Uh, the heart's supposed to be the size of a human, or at least able to replace that one. So I will have to pack a tranquilizer and I'm, in case something does go bad I, I I might need my might need my gun to point at someone. That they're obviously already using violence against me, against my name, taking my research and everything. I see it only necessary to, to have something to use. Yeah. But I haven't completely made it into the house. I, I'm i parked outside, Coleman, as I've... You've been quite efficient in getting everything together on the way home. I have stopped for a bit. I'm just thinking to myself, where have I seen this piece of cloth from? Just holding it in my hand. I'm going to ask... I'm going to ask Mikkel if she recognizes it from somewhere. And I get out of the car, and then there's the phone call. Yes, uh, Coleman. Dr. Christensen, uh, all sorted. I've managed to get a little favor called in, and uh, some cleaners will show us the way, and we can get into those tunnels. That's all I could get, but maybe when we're there, we could get a little bit of direction. But yeah, there we go. We'll use the tunnels, uh, get into the... Well, place, and then I guess I'm bringing a little cash with me. Maybe we can uh, find out where your thing is, the uh, diplomatic way. But I am dressing down. We need to be careful. Perfect. That's excellent. Thank you. Um, I'm at my home. I'm just going to collect a few things, and, and then I'll I'll be on my way, and I'll be there soon. Did you need anything else from me before we go there? No, I don't think so. I'm bringing some protection, just just in case, and uh, I'm bringing a uh, emergency phone. Um, what I'm thinking is maybe if all goes well, as soon as we're somewhere safe, we can get the police and get us out of there. Just yeah, yeah, and I yeah, I think that that would be the obvious thing. If we if we actually stumble upon my stolen material, then the it would make sense to just call the police and inform them that it's there. Yeah, good, good plan. And I'm thinking to myself whether I, I'm sure about that. I, uh, there is a slight risk that they'll confiscate something from me, uh, that I don't have time to be wrapped up in legal proceedings. But maybe I can make those particularly things scarce 
Especially with the help of Coleman. Yeah, that'll work. Good. Good. Um, I, I think I can be there in an hour. I'll see you there. And I hang up and I begin driving, being careful to avoid traffic if I can, making sure to check the route first, just in case there's lots of, I don't know, blockades up. Again, it's really unusual, all this, but hopefully we can be in, be out, and well then, I won't feel so bad. After all, Dr. Christensen saved my life. Like, I do owe him this, and so even if it's maybe a little dangerous, well, hopefully everything will be fine. You end up taking numerous detours to avoid running into protesters, counter-protesters, and the city is in a real bad shape as you're, you're driving through it. You, you you end up having to drive off quite quickly sometimes as people are smashing windows, even, even looting. I mean, this isn't supposed to happen in a place like Corvallis, right? I mean, Portland, sure, but here? The country is is in a poor state. It has been for a long time, but this latest thing, it, it seems to have pushed everything over the edge. Hmm. It's certainly concerning. I'm glad I've dressed down. Again, I'm going to park my car somewhere safe. Although it isn't sure, so I suppose that's not the end of the world. And yeah, I'll make my way to where we need to go and wait for the doctor. Yes. And Dr. Christensen, we go to you then. Where are you headed, actually? Mikhail and uh, Cadence uh, are, of course, at the hospital still. I rise with the neighbors. Where are you headed? As I see that her car isn't here, then she hasn't made her back. It does make me a bit worried, and I feel a bit bad. I I would have hoped that it was just a, a s- smaller well incident and uh, that they'd be fine by now I take a photo instead of the piece of cloth I send it off to to my wife after having asked her like how are things going will they be back soon uh, I you try to call her no I just send that uh, a message saying that uh I, uh, me and Coleman have some things we wanted to look into, but, uh, should be with you again tonight when we're back home. Uh, by the way, do you, do you recognize this piece of cloth? I, I found it when I was out with the kayak race and we were lost for a bit and, uh, thought it uh, looked oddly familiar. Probably nothing, but still. Yeah, you send that message. And, uh, then I'm off after having collected a tranquilizer of sort. Yes, yeah, you have the sedatives that are required for something like this. You you have been prepared for a situation like this, of course, uh, in case it would ever become necessary. You have exactly the right kind and the right amounts. You know, you know how to do this safely. You have um, harnesses and things like that that you might require in order to carry um, the specimen. Also. Yeah. And I prepare the fold-up cage that we'd put away in case I need to store it at home. Yeah. Uh, and then I feel like I have everything ready. Uh, you do? Yeah. Whew. <laughs> I feel a bit of excitement and it's scary at the same time. I hope it's in, in good shape. I hope it's still alive and just imagine if I can actually... I can actually get there and get it get it back all right yeah yeah you could you could resume your your research you could you could find the the solutions that you were looking for you could you you could find the the way to do this safely and and then the hospital they they would regret having fired you yeah you'd be able to capitalize on this all by yourself after all it's all of the things you have done up until now will finally be worth it. Yeah. Yeah. This is this is great. This is great. I mustn't get too excited though. I uh, try and uh, uh, call myself. Think about other things. Think about, think about practical matters. Uh, yes. Once this is done, and once the surgery is done, because that's gonna happen. Let's visualize it like that. Once it's all done, I am. Um, 
I'm gonna explore what we found in the forest. Gosh, that was interesting. That was something else. I'm gonna, I'm gonna buy my own kayak. I'm gonna get what else do I need? A GoPro, maybe a camera to witness anything, and life vest. And I start putting things in my head, making a, a, a to-do list of things that I will do once this is all over and done with, because we will succeed with this. Yeah. Does it does it feel real to you now? It 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 started feeling unreal there for a bit, but have you come around to it? It, it did it make sense that that all those things happened, all those things you saw over there were they real? Have you decided that they were, or or were they just stress and concussion, possibly? I didn't have a concussion. It you did. They said I didn't. Uh, Coleman was the one that was injured, and his story still aligns with mine. Of everything I said, he didn't deny it. If if it were just me, he didn't. sure. Something happened. Something happened. We ended up somewhere we shouldn't have been, and I don't know how that happened, uh, and how to completely make sense of it, but uh, there might be a way to replicate it, and... Is where my scientific brain goes to experimentation. Hmm. Yes. Experimentation indeed. It's exciting. But first things first. So, you head towards the alumni center then? Yeah. I did expect everything to take a little time. Uh, but now that I didn't have Mikhail to talk to, maybe I'll make it there under the hour. Uh, if traffic isn't too bad. Yeah, it's... You too find yourself, of course, having to take detours. You see the same things as Mr. Coleman saw. You've never seen Corvallis like this. So much anger. From... From all sides. It's... What, what, whatever happened to that country that you grew up in? It wasn't like this. No. And this is not the reason why we moved out here. This is... a state. How could it get like this? Out here... It takes me back to, to old times, like... Seattle, things that happened there. Here... It's like something has just fallen like a shadow over the whole place like some kind of madness like everyone is just t- torn up into something and it's been going on for a while but you've never seen it like this never like this and you arrive at the alumni center it is that same building that you went to during the charity dinner and you find Mr. Coleman um, standing outside having come out of his car you, of course, came with the car that you uh, got as a replacement vehicle. And the two of you meet. It's now quite dark outside, and you do see that there is a truck standing outside of the Alumni Center marked Eugene Facility Services. There's lights on inside. The blinds are down, but... There seems to be some kind of activity going on in there. Perhaps this cleaner that uh, was referenced by Mr. Coleman. All right, Doctor. I guess we'll go see our friends. And uh, let's uh, get this going. <laughs> I look at the cleaning truck a bit hesitantly. Then, seeing how Coleman reacts to it all, it seems like this is part of the plan. And uh, I think to myself that that's quite impressive, actually, if that's... Some sort of cover for us. Uh, and I say, yeah, look, uh, thank you again. Thank you for, well, uh, yeah, let's, uh, I appreciate this. Oh, like I, no, like I said, I, I owe you, and uh, are you feeling okay? You're still a bit nervous? Still a bit shaken by what we talked about? I know that you were getting a little excited about all that stuff that, Happened, but you have to remember it's not all exactly as you thought it was. No, I I know it's uh, we we were under a lot of uh, stress. I just 
some of the things that we both experienced, and again, I don't, I ha I felt that I had to put that pressure on you then because I, I didn't want you to just completely look away from all this. But well, it would have been easier. I mean, again, some of the stuff doesn't make sense because, well, for example, the one one of those people I thought I saw, well, he's dead. So, what does that mean? <laughs> oh. What do you mean? Well, the person you thought you saw me attacking. I mean, they might not have been what you think, because that that man, for example, is actually... Well, I, they looked an awful lot like someone I once knew, uh, who worked for me, actually. A, uh, Jonas Strand, but, well, he's dead, so... Oh, really? He is. I myself saw someone, a, f a face that I recognized, obviously, in my my daughter's face and I felt up, up until almost just now I, I felt quite convinced that it somehow was her although she was up in a tree and she uh, I don't think she had any hair on her head neither of would which makes sense cause, right yeah but you have to realize that wasn't that definitely wasn't your daughter what it might have been is well maybe things that we thought looked like people we knew but was something else but, again, don't worry too much about that sort of thing. I I'll tell you this. Ghosts don't just walk around and shoot people. Or, or you know, or, or form protests. I, I laugh, look, gesturing towards the possible sounds of protest that might be nearby. So, uh... Do you think there's that that's connected somehow? Do you think uh, us both hallucinating in some sort of way could cause some sort of mass hysteria uh, among that other people are seeing things that make them equally unbalanced. I think you've got it the wrong way around, Doctor. I say, frowning. It might be not us causing this, it might be them causing this, or some sort of force, and maybe you and I are the only ones who can see it for what it is. But uh, let's not worry about that right now. Let's Let's get in the tunnels. And focus on this task, and then we can talk about this sort of thing later. I'll invite you to uh, 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 my house sometime, and you can, <laughs> if, you, if you really want to, I can enlighten you a little. I put two and two together in my head about what he told me just earlier about his family and artifacts and talked about dark forces, and I mean, it all sounds a little bit much, but... Somehow, it also connects with what I've seen. Uh, so I... I just think that maybe I should be open to to venues, as long as I'm not t doing something stupid like taking drugs or getting <clears throat> into some sort of rituals. Uh, yes, that sounds... Yes, I, I would love to come over to, to see your... Your, your place and your collection, absolutely. And uh, again, I, I want to reiterate that you are very welcome to uh, meet the family again. Again, they, they, they liked you very much, and I understand if you feel like you have a certain history or whatever, but don't let that overshadow who you really are. You're a kind person, all right? I nod and kind of start walking on. That's not entirely a bad idea. Maybe that's why I'm talking to the doctor like this. Maybe it's because... Well, maybe if he could just learn a little, I wouldn't have to take this burden on alone. After all, I almost do sometimes take on the burden of that house and protecting it alone. And who knows, maybe he could have some modern ideas. Uh, Dr. Christensen is a good man. But for now, I don't say any of this. I just nod and say, come on, let's, let's get going. I feel a bit hopeful. And I'm glad to, to see him not refuse it straight away this time. And I do follow him, and uh, let's see then where it takes us. You notice that the um, the front door is closed, but there is a kind of side door close to where the vehicle is, and that one is actually a bit ajar, as, someone, as though someone has left it open for you. Which would make sense, given what you had set up, Mr. Coleman. I reckon this is our entrance point, and I'll very subtly do my best to go inside, quietly. 
You do so. Inside is mostly quiet, but there is the sound of a vacuum cleaner going somewhere. You know how when you get into a building and there's someone that's cleaning, but it's, it's quite far away. It's this kind of low humming sound of the vacuum cleaner going back and forth. Mm, mm, that kind of sound. It's fascinating to see how work can continue in one place as a city burns in another. There's um, chairs that are stacked and placed against the walls here. Some signs still remain from the event that you attended. Feels like an eternity ago, but it was only a few days. The entrance down to the basement area, you see it from here, Dr. Christensen. You could take Mr. Coleman there if you would like. The place looks so desolate as we walk through it, and, well, I suppose that all makes sense. There's also a slight bit of calm being here, as compared to the madness of the city, just hearing that white noise almost of the vacuum cleaner. Um, All right, Um, it's down this way is where the tunnels are that I found. Uh, Are we waiting for someone else? You are not. Then... uh, down here. Okay, uh, lead the way. And as we step down to those tunnels, how dark is it? Is there some sort of emergency lighting system going on? Is there low neon lights, or do I need to use the torch? Well, the first area you come down to is that, that place with the cardboard standees. You, know, you have Brandon Cooks, Stephen Jackson, Terry Baker, legends of the Oregon State University Beavers. Mr. Coleman, did you, did you ever care about football, or was that just never an interest of yours? Not even remotely an interest. I was just pretended. Then these names mean very, very little to you. You just know that, yeah, the, the city were would celebrate them, and some of them ended up in the NFL and did quite well for themselves. Good for them. And Dr. Christensen, you, of course, see the door that you went through that, that takes you all the way down into the, the, the tunnel network, and, and it's right there. It's... Um, Got a little bit of light here, although you remember when you got down into the tunnel network there, it was quite dark. So I guess we want to head eastwards or westwards. Do you remember exactly where the hall is from here? I uh, look at my maps easy enough on my phone, figuring out where to go, though of course our location will get lost as soon as we get down there, but at least to get a a sense of direction. Uh, There were signs down there, and... You figure once you get down there, as long as you could find a sign that would point towards the the main campus, you could just simply follow that one. If there is not one, then at least just head as far north as you could. That should get you close to where you need to be. Hopefully in a better spot than you would be if you tried to go the topside route. Yeah. So uh, we should be going north for a while, and that's uh, where it's going to take us the closest. Uh, I, I'm not sure how well the lighting works down there, so it's good that you brought a flashlight as well. I'm uh, picking mine up from a uh, duffel bag that I've got with me that's got the harness and the sedatives uh, and, uh, yeah, my gun. I'm not someone to put it in my belt or something like that. Uh, it's it's there in a holster. I, yeah, I don't have it on a side arm holster or anything like that either it's it's just not the way I would have used it before I don't usually carry it with me so it feels a bit strange and I almost almost embarrassedly make sure I don't show that when I pick the flashlight up yeah hmm yes you do your best to keep it hidden Well, you do find yourself now back in this long, dark corridor. There's these thick pipes in the ceiling. There's a a kind of bluish light coming from them, or from somewhere up above, some kind of emergency lighting that just keeps on going, but it's on a very low level, so that you have your flashlights with you is certainly very helpful. There are signs um, on the floor, arrows. We see one pointing towards Research Stadium, College of Veterinary Science... And when you look closely, you see that, yes, there is one towards the Oregon State University campus as well. Yeah. There's this humming sound coming from the the lights as you see this. So what do you do? I guess we start heading in that direction. Uh, Good idea, Dr. Christensen. Nice and calm down here. Hopefully we'll pop up somewhere in the building. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. You, you've seen what I see. The, there are directions, so it should be easy enough to find with the help of those. I feel a bit hesitant, though. I just, I stop and listen to that hum just for a, a second, as uh, I have made certain connections in my head that I don't think are accurate, but they're still there, and I, it doesn't sound anything like the. The hum out in the forest, in the, in the in the building, right? No, it's. You focus on the hum. You focus on it, and and you you feel like it's starting to shift. Like it's not not just a hum, but that it's it's got a kind of mechanical tone to it, like like a heavy machine, like whirring and and grinding. Do you want to focus further on this sound, Dr. Christensen? You you can. Yeah, I say to... kind of idly to Coleman, why don't you, yeah, up here, and I let him start taking the lead so I can just passively follow for a while as I as listen to that, that strange mechanical-like sound. I would like you to roll to see through the illusion. That's 18. The noise is very clear, yes. It's machinery. Hmm, a lot of machines. There's a hall down on the right there. That's where a lot of the noise seems to be coming from, actually. You didn't see that hall before. You you don't remember seeing any hall there before, but it is there. You could go have a look, see what is causing all this noise. It might be... It might be interesting. There's something very inviting about that sound. But it is your choice. Some... Some... Um... Someone's doing something. I I just say... Again, quite idly. And I... Take off in that direction. Mr. Coleman... You... Hear Dr. Christensen... Kind of disappearing behind you. What do you... What do you do when, when that happens? Well, I suppose I turn round. Do I see where he goes? I'd probably try and follow. I mean, he's supposed to be the one really leading the way. Yeah, he's he's not here. Dr. Christensen, you, you're you heading down this hall now, and, and yes, you see you see things as they truly are. Because here is, is something quite wondrous. It's... Uh, the hall opens up into what is a vast underground hall. A vast field of of machines in front of you. It's like a a massive f- server farm or something like that. But but the machines are completely different. It's not racks of computers. No, these these machines they feel old, mechanical, almost Victorian. There's a, a sound like a, it's a something that disappears behind one of the machines. You saw metal. Yeah. Like a, like a metal leg. The machines are grinding and whirring, and, and you see all this. What do you, what do you do? I look at all this with the eyes, the curious eyes of science, of someone who uh, has just discovered something marvelous. Someone built all this long ago by the looks of it. These are old machines. They're all going. They're all making... I can't quite see what. Wait, is there... Is that someone there? Uh, hello? I... Try to go and see who, who that was. Is that someone there? That leg looked strange. You head further in then. I understand. You hear the clicking sound from behind one of these machines, and yes, they, they look so old, so strange. They, they do remind you of things you've seen from, from photos from the Victorian times in England, perhaps. Primitive, yet very complex, and featuring a lot of small cogs, and you again focus in on that thing that was moving... And 
it is there behind the machine. It's got spider-like legs. There's flesh and steel amalgated in a very, very strange and misshapen way. It's some kind of aberration. It stares at you. You see the eye from the side. It doesn't turn around completely. It's a bloodshot eye. It looks human. I want you to roll to keep it together because this is not something that is possible. Definitely not possible. No. That is 16. How do you remain in control in spite of seeing this thing? This impossible thing underneath the alumni center? The whole place has me taken in awe. The minute tiny little cogs that were and move around and now this. I am... I feel like I'm frightened and nervous at some part of me, but curiosity has taken the upper hand. I I kneel down at this, this little, little thing, this creation. Hi there, little fella. What are you... What are you doing down here? You see this part machine, part well, something biological. It holds out a, a spider-like leg towards you. Do you touch it? I... It's trying to communicate with me. It's trying to maybe indicate something, but, or it's reaching toward me. I, my first instinct is to look behind me, see if it's pointing at something. No, it is not. You are alone here with it and the machines. Hmm. Well, I, I guess I reach out my hand. Maybe it wants to show me something. It's very cold. And then it's very hot. And then cold again. The eye blinks. You think there's a head and it goes to one side and then to another and then it removes the leg from your hand and it quickly scampers away wow it's gone it's just you and the machines wow wow I I keep saying that to myself as I look at my hand and it was like it was pulsating like with the the heat and the cold that came and went like like a pulse of life in all that technology so crude and, and yet I uh, stand up and I I would chuckle to myself if I wasn't so on edge uh, uh, did you see that Coleman? Mr. Coleman you found Dr. Christensen he's been looking at the wall for a while now and not said anything. You have tried to catch his attention on a number of occasions and you seem to be getting his attention now, though. Uh, doctor, are you okay? See what? Uh, the wall? Yes, I do, but, um, I don't think this is the way to go. <laughs> not the, not the wall. Coleman, I, and I, I turned to, to look at what I was looking at. It is the wall. The machines are gone. The creature is gone. But you're sure it was there. You felt it. You felt it in your hand. Yeah. You still see some of the... the dust. You... you touched it. There was some kind of black dust. Probably from the machines. You did touch it. It did happen. Coleman. I... I understand think I understand what you what you mean there are there are things this place is connected to it too places <laughs> it's incredible it's incredible
You have listened to an episode of Red Moon Roleplaying, where we play the scenario A Hole in My Heart for Cult Divinity Lost. We have created this scenario ourselves, and this series is sponsored by Helmgast. The music was made by Atrium Carceri, and was used with permission from their label, Cryochamber. Check out their website at cryochamber.bandcamp.com or their YouTube channel for some moody dark ambient for your gaming table. We would like to give massive thanks to our champions of the Red Moon, Martin Hoshobert, Simon Cooper, David, Julia, Camilla, Bob Lange, Cameron, Anton, Graham Barry, and Doug Thompson for their generous support. And we would of course also like to thank all of our other patrons. Without your support, the show would not be possible. If you want to support our work, please check us out on Patreon. You can get access to bonus campaigns for Cult Divinity Lost and Coriolis there, as well as get early and raw access to all of our recordings. You can also hear your name read on the show as a champion of the Red Moon, as well as play Cult with us. Most importantly, that support is what keeps the show going, so do check us out there. Thank you again for listening, and remember that death, that is only the beginning.